Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Y'all awake? Welcome to my world, brother, on crickets, you know. So, uh, man, it's good to be here this, this morning. I, I know last week we started a new series called Failed, a Failure, and uh, you guys were quiet. Uh, it's funny you said that. Um, you know, anytime you dig down deep and you start poking around in somebody's soul, um, it can get real quiet. And it's almost, uh, you know, some of you looked at me last week like, <laughs> and, and it was kind of like, whoa, wait a minute. If you remember last week, um, we talked about how God has gifted us, and each of us have gifts, and, and the reason God's gifted us is because he says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, because he has certain potential for all of us that he wants us to have. And we know that because if you go back to Jeremiah uh, chapter 1, that when we were conceived in the womb, that God had plans for us that all along he had certain plans that he wanted for us. If you remember last week, we talked about how we were born and then we get to that certain point of whatever age you are and you evaluate your life and what you realize is, is your reality is different than your potential. And so what happens is, is in between our potential and our reality, there's what we have this gap and that gap for many of us is that frustration gap that, to where we, we see our potential. We see what God, and remember those dreams we had as children. You remember those dreams we had as teenagers. And then all of a sudden our reality is it's not what we thought. And then what happens is, is we have what's called, I like to call the failure gap. Because anytime there's a gap in our reality to our potential, we'll begin to look for escapes. And those escapes are those substitutes that we think are going to fill what we think is going to reach our potential really in reality create more anxiety and it creates more of frustration because in every one of our lives, I want to show you this, this is interesting because uh, we, we all have what I call twin towers of truth. And the twin towers of truth are simply this. Every one of us have a tower that I like to call our identity. And our identity, if you'll remember, was when God created us. Every one of us have an identity. And when we came to Christ and we became a believer in Jesus Christ, he gave us a new heart, a new life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So that means when we came to Christ, our identity changed. But we also have another tower because in every one of us, we have what's called a tower of failure. Because the reality is for many of us, we've not lived up to our identity, have we? If everybody was really honest in this room, as I said last week, there's a certain amount of dysfunction in everybody in this room, amen? Okay, go ahead and say yes. yes. All right, uh, I love what AA says, we're all sick, some are just sicker than others, amen? amen. Okay. So what happens is we have this identity and we have this failure. And I love what David said a couple of weeks ago when he was uh, up here uh, speaking. He said, you know, it's not the, the, the stories in our life that, that screw us up. It's the stories we tell ourselves. Because many of you are telling stories that all center around right here. And see, the Twin Towers of Truth is all about story. Everybody has a story. And last week we were talking about how the scripture is full of men and women who were colossal failures. 
And, and it was God's response to our failure. And, and as we went through that list last week and we talked about all those men and women, they're liars and cheaters and murderers and, and, and all these guys that failed. What it is, is we all have this and we all have this, but here's the power of story is that when these two things come together, the power of our identity and, and our failure or, or maybe even our sin, that when we understand that in light of our identity, all of a sudden it becomes this powerful story that God wants to tell so that you and I can then be used in how God's created us. That when we're able to face those, those failures and, and, and reconcile that with our identity, what we have is meaning. What we have is worship. What we have is impact. And then all of a sudden we began to close that gap of our reality to our potential. But at some point you have to look at your failures or pain that every one of us in this room have been through. I think one of the most powerful stories in scripture as I was studying for this series is, is found in 1 Kings chapter 17 through 19. If you have your Bibles, your apps, you might turn over there. It's the story of Elijah. It's one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. And it's one of those stories that... Um, I think illustrates how God responds to failure, to pain. In fact, of all the chapters in my life, I think in the ministry of Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 19 is probably the most powerful response of God responding to when Elijah is kind of twisted off. Now, if you don't know the story of Elijah, Elijah was an Old Testament prophet that God was using to bring his people back. And, and, and 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, look at this. It says, Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, Ahab was the king of that day. He was an evil king, and he was a king that was not reigning well. And so God sent his prophet as he did all through the Old Testament to bring them in and to bring judgment on them. And, and so he went to Ahab and he says, as the Lord God of Israel lives before who I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain for these years except by my word. Now think about that. In an agricultural culture, he goes up to the king, who his whole kingdom is based on agriculture. And he says, by the way, everything you're doing right now is about to die. And it'll only rain when I tell it to. That made him a wanted man. And now I'm sure at first Ahab was like, yeah, sure, buddy. Then six months goes by. And then a year goes by. And sure enough, there's no rain. And we think we've had drought around here. But can you imagine in an agricultural uh, setting where rain just stops? So God told Elijah, he said, look, man, you need to get away because you're going to be a wanted man. And so he sent him out to live by this brook, this stream. And so while all the land was drying up, God took care of him and met his need there by that stream. And then when the stream uh, dried up, you can read all this in 1 Kings uh, 17 and 18. When the stream, stream dried up, he then sent him to a widow's house, this poor widow. Now in those days, widows weren't just widows. They were poor because everything was based on a male society and supporting. And so in that day, to go to a widow's house, that, that was a pretty barren place. And she had one son there. And, and so God said, if you'll go there, I'll meet your needs. He goes to the widow, tells her that God has sent him. She goes, look, I'm a poor widow. I don't have anything. He says this, you take care of me and God will take care of you. And we see the story where he kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. They never went without. They never went without food. And then while he was there, her son died. And so Elijah comes along and he's like, no problem. He goes upstairs, raises the kid from the dead. And I mean, he's having this incredible ministry going on. And then we find in 1 Kings chapter 18, he goes back to King Ahab. It's coming to the end of the, of the drought. He's been a wanted man. And so he goes back to King Ahab in, in 1 Kings chapter 18. And he tells King Ahab, hey, the, the drought is about to end. But he challenges him to a face-off. He says, look, you believe in your bell gods. I believe in the one true God. And so let's, I, I challenge you, let's see whose God is most powerful. So what they did was they built this altar each of them built their own altar. And so uh, the, the Babylonians and King Ahab at that point, they built this altar. They, they, they started to cut the meat up, put it on the altar. And they started crying out to their gods, not God, their gods. And, and nothing was happening. Elijah was mocking them. You need to go back and read this story. It's so awesome. But God, he was uh, mocking them. Is your God asleep? Is your God in the bathroom? And, and they're dancing around the altar, calling out to God, cutting themselves. And it's just this crazy scene. And, when, and finally, when they're done, at the end, and this goes on all day. And when they get to the end of that, Elijah goes, y'all done? 
All right, tell you what, cover the altar with water, not once, not twice, not so. I mean, cover it, dig a trench around it, put, the, put, put, put water in the trench. And he just says a simple prayer, God, would you rain down fire from heaven? And it not only burned up the altar and everything, burned up all the guys around him, it's just an incredible scene. And then right after that, Elijah goes on this war path and he kills all the bell gods. And I mean, it's just crazy, crazy scene. And I just, every time I read that, I'm like, dude, that's so good. Then after that, they were running back and Elijah runs on foot, outruns a guy on a horse. I mean, how would you like to see that? Pulls up his old skirt, man, takes off running. And I just get this vision, man, of Forrest Gump running across the desert, outrunning the horse, man. And the rain clouds are coming up. It's just this incredible story. But then in chapter 19, it takes a really big twist. Because see, I think that's where many of us are. Many of us find ourselves in this really great moment. And then something happened and we twist off. Now, let's pick it up in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. You've kind of got the background. So here it is, 1 Kings chapter 1, all that, the rains come down, and, and Elijah's murdered all the Baal prophets, and they, he's taken them all out. He's ran back, and, and Ahab gets back to Jezebel, his wife. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, let the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, I'm going to kill you. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. I'm talking about Elijah. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree or a juniper tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life for I'm no better than my father's. You ever been there? You ever just had everything going right and then all of a sudden, one little threat or maybe a big threat comes along and we run to a place of isolation by our own doing. Maybe by the behavior of someone else in your life. That something happened years ago. And because of that event, you run. And just when God was ready, where God needed him most, when he faced the threat of Jezebel, he suddenly became fearful and discouraged, which I think we all have been there, haven't we? Some of you are there this morning. That we become fearful and discouraged. And so Elijah deserted his post and he ran for his life. And we have to ask the question, how could this happen to such a man of God? I mean, he's seen all these incredible things in his journey. And then you're like, why in the world would he run? Why would he do it now? You see, what I want to show you today is that the Lord wasn't through with Elijah. And failure doesn't mean defeat or an end to our ministry or our mission Failure is never final as long as love exists. Let me say that again. I'm going to say this every week. Failure is never final as long as love exists. And his name is Jesus. I don't think we're that much different from Elijah. When we look at Elijah and we say, how can you do that? We can ask our own self that. How do we end up where we are? In fact, if you look at Psalm 73, I want to show you this. This is interesting. I studied this a few weeks ago. It says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant I was a brute beast before you. I want you to notice in verse 21, the hurt and the disappointment. My heart was grieved. I was embittered. And then notice in verse 22, the human condition, that when we're grieved and when we're, we're, when we're embittered, that we become senseless. You ever been senseless? Come on, be honest. Yeah. Have you ever been ignorant? Where somebody looks at you and go, how could you do that? Or why would you do that? I was a brute beast before you. As I said last week, I think we're all capable. It doesn't take much to create a shadow, does it? I mean, we can be doing all the right things, but gradually we shift our motives to be more about applause or comfort or power or control than for the glory of God. You see, when you reconcile these two things here, all of a sudden it brings glory to God in your story. That as you face your failures and you know your identity, that you're able to learn from these and what God's doing, all of a sudden your story becomes powerful in a worship sense to magnify him. See, we live in shadows, we keep secrets because we don't want people to know our hidden fears, do we? Our selfish dreams. So we hide from everyone. And yeah, we come into a place like this on Sunday morning or you go to your work and somebody asks you, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, I'm fine. And everybody's looking at you going, no, you're not. Something's up because they're seeing the behavior of your life. Because see, our behavior is based on what we believe. 
And many of us are believing only one side of the Twin Towers of Truth. And so what comes out of our beliefs comes our behavior. And, and as I told you last week, we need to round our story out to grace of who we are in Christ and what he says. And, and here's, a, here's a scary thing. We can become so adept at the description of the stories we tell ourselves that we can't even admit them to ourselves. I was reading an article this last week in Church Leaders by a guy named Mark Love. He's a furniture maker, former pastor in Wimberley, Texas, and he was talking about, uh, in there, about significant secrets of the lives of pastors. And as I was reading through that, I thought, you know what? That's really not any different than all of us. He wrote down 11 things about the secret lives of pastors, and I wanna share six of them with you, and I wanna personalize them for us, not just me, but for all of us. He says that most of us have a great fear that our lives are gonna end up irrelevant. That many of us are afraid that what we do every day and what, we do, what we've become, that we've devoted our lives to accomplish is not really changing lives or making a difference. Maybe you got married and you thought that was gonna be that and that ended in a divorce and then the next one ended in divorce and then the next one ended in divorce. Maybe you've been married 30, 40, maybe even 50 years and you can't stand the woman or the man you're married to. You served in the military and you saw things no human being should ever see and you came home and no one thanked you and, and, and all those memories are, you're setting back there and you're, you're just, you're stewing over those and don't even know what to do with them. Or you got that dream job only to learn that they're not gonna pay you enough or maybe on the flip side, they're gonna pay you so much you can never see your family and you'll never be home. We call that a golden handcuff. Or maybe you had children and they rebelled and twisted off and today they have nothing to do with you. And you worked all your life and you saved and they told you if you saved and you gave to Social Security and you saved up enough money that retirement would be anything you ever dreamed of and yet some of you know that that's not the truth because you're working at that job and it's just not what you dreamed of. And there's something in all of us that we're scared to death we're gonna end up in a life of irrelevance. And we think about quitting a lot. We think about quitting a lot. Many of you feel discouraged because you don't see any visible tangible results of your efforts and you feel jealous because your friends seem to make a whole lot more money than you and have a whole lot more fun because you're looking at their highlight reels on Facebook. And so you look at that and you get jealous and you think about quitting and secretly you wonder if you made the right career choice or married the right mate. Some of you spend a whole lot of time daydreaming about a different job or a different marriage or a different life altogether. And I think the reason is, is what Mark was saying is because many of us in this room are spiritually starving. We're spiritually starving. But the only thing that you're getting to feed your soul is what comes on Sunday morning. The problem is you couldn't live on one meal a week, right? Physically, what makes you think you can live spiritually on one meal a week? He also goes on to say people are sinful, no different than you. You know, there's a few of us in here that harbor the secrets of the younger brother and the prodigal son. Illicit sex, greed, pornography, addictions. And yet I realize that even some of you in this room harbor the secrets of the older brother. Self-righteousness, resentment, arrogance. The first gets all the attention, doesn't it? As we're seeing even right now in our media, the younger brother sins get all the attention. Because see, most of us don't want people to know we commit either kind, do we? We don't want them to think that we're the older brother or the younger brother. And we may occasionally admit a weakness every once in a while, but we just don't want people to know. And the reality is we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. There's nobody in this room that ever measures up and that's why Jesus came. Because failure is never final as long as love exists. He goes on to say we're lonely because it's hard to trust. Because see, maybe you took a risk. Maybe you took a risk here and you got burned. Maybe you took a risk here and you joined a small group and it didn't work out the way you thought it would. And so now you don't wanna trust anybody. Or maybe that first marriage just wounded you so deeply that now you don't wanna trust anybody. You see, in the 12-step world, people know they're only as sick as their secrets. And as long as we try to hide our insecurities, our sins, and our limitations, we're gonna suffer far more pain than is necessary. As long as we continue to focus on that failure side and never understand our identity of how God has created us as men and as women, in the glory of God that he's given us a new beginning, we're gonna to continue to harbor those secrets. Instead, we have to learn to be completely honest with ourselves, with God, and at least one other person. 
so that we can begin to work through that story. Back in 1 Kings chapter 19, failure is never final as long as love exists. Look at God's provision for Elijah. Look at verse 5 in chapter 19. Elijah's out, he's out, ran his servant, he's out by himself. And then as he lay down and slept under a juniper tree, a juniper tree is not the best shade tree you could ever have. It's these gnarly branches. It doesn't really give a, lot of, a whole lot of shade. And so he comes out there and he's laying under this juniper tree trying to get some rest. And so it goes. See, we all have our man-made solutions to get relief, don't we? We all try to cover up our stuff or try to get under something that never was designed to give us shelter, refuge or even solutions to our pain. When those escapes come in and that sin comes in or, or, or that dream job of golden handcuffs, we think that'll do it. And really it's just a juniper tree. We're no different than Elijah. And out of exhaustion, Elijah fell asleep. And look what happened in verse five. Then as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he lay down again. In verse seven, and the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. See, verse five, there's, there's two different angels that show up in this passage. And I, I, you need to see this because some of you are under a juniper tree right now. Some of you are fixing, we're gonna see you're in a cave. But I want you to see how God was pursuing Elijah. Because that first angel we see was just an angel. But in verse seven, we see that it says the angel of the Lord that's very important because it was no ordinary angel. This was a manifestation of the second person of the Trinity. It was Jesus himself coming to touch Elijah. It shows us, you know, why, why would God not send him more ravens? If you go back and you read, God fed him with the ravens. Why didn't he send him to another brook? Why didn't he send him to another, to another widow's home? No, God himself stepped into his story. Stepped into right in the middle of his pain to show the prophet Elijah that his love and his grace to remind him and to remind us that even when we're sinners and alienated from God, that he sent his son for us. He said, let me teach you something here. All scripture is Christocentric. All scripture points to Jesus. Everything points back to Jesus. Everything was pointed to Jesus. And so we see even in the Old Testament that Jesus was being featured in the story of Elijah in his greatest pain, in his greatest moment that Jesus was stepping right into the middle of it. And listen, the Lord wasn't condoning Elijah's behavior. He wasn't condoning or overlooking it. No, he was assuring Elijah that he was still the object of his love. And somebody needs to hear that this morning. Because some of you this morning, you come into this place and you realize you are in sin and you are laying under a juniper tree, or maybe you're already in the cave and it's a little more comfortable. But you need to understand that, that, that we are the object of his love and that he still has a plan and a purpose for a prophet just as he has for us when we're out of his plan. That God wants to take that tower of failure and line that up with your identity so that the foundation would be the glory of God. And yet you're stuck under a juniper tree. It also affirmed the power of God that when Jesus showed up, and though the means may be completely lacking for us, and all may appear lost and hopeless, there is never an end to the degree of God's love and care, nor the capacity and the power of God's disposal to supply any need at any time. Failure is never final long as love exists. Failure is never final as long as love exists. I read from Craig Crochelle this morning. He said, never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Never let the presence of a storm. Some of you are in a storm, man, and that juniper tree is not providing much, is it? Never let it doubt the presence of God. Look at verse eight. So he arose and he ate and drank and he went in strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights. This brother is running as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. You know, you, you see that the mountain of God and you think, okay, he's going where God wants him to go. He's going where God's wanting to go. And we might be tempted to think that's, that was God's orders, but the reality is two times in verses nine and 13, you know what God asked him? What are you doing here? What are you doing here, son? All of a sudden, God steps into that great role of a counselor. He's working for Elijah to evaluate where he is, why he's here and what he was doing. He was there because he was still running away. Look at verse nine, and there he went into a cave and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. His physical circumstances have now improved. 
He's still running from God. The juniper tree wasn't good. And now all of a sudden he goes into a cave. And listen, that's where some of you are this morning. You see, the cave represents just another human strategy for refuge. The cave represents another substitute for God as a refuge. That Elijah now is all of a sudden comfortable. See, some of you were under a juniper tree and now you found yourself in a cave and it's a little more comfortable and and things have kind of settled down a little bit around you. But listen, you're still running from God and you're stuck there because you're waiting for God to tell you some supernatural thing that you're in sin. (laughs) He may have felt better, but he was not where God wanted him spiritually speaking. Look at verse nine. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night in that place and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, this was designed, I believe, to be a soul searching question. I think all of us are to ask, what are you doing here? Did he understand why he was there from the standpoint, from God's standpoint, from his own to God's? Did he grasp what was really happening? Did he understand that he was there because of faulty thinking, because of focusing on nothing but failure and threats? Did he really understand his identity? I mean, how could he forget it? How could he forget what God had designed him and what all he had already seen? And yet he had one event in his life, one threat brought pain. And now he's just functioning over here. He's in the cave. Look at verse 10, look at his response. I've been zealous for the Lord of hosts and for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. His very answer shows that he's not grasped the issues of what's going on. He was still hurting over his failure. He was still hurting over the pain. He was still hurting over the threat. He was filled with his own importance. I'm the only one this has ever happened to. Don't you see God? And he was angry over the lack of response from the help from others or God. See, we're either, gonna, we're either gonna blame God or we're just gonna wanna get out of it as quickly as possible. I'm the only one this has ever happened to. He was bitter because he had served the Lord so earnestly and spectacularly and still here he was in rejection and exile. Why is this woman coming after me? Why is this happening? In verse 11, then he said, talking about God, God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. I think the Lord was just simply ignoring Elijah's self-justification for reason. (laughs) Instead, he offers him instruction that would result in a special revelation that would change his life to show how God works. And some of you need to hear this this morning. Elijah's told to go out of a cave and stand before the Lord. Remember, this cave represented his human strategy. I'm gonna run into a cave, I'm gonna get comfortable, and maybe that'll fix me. See, I don't know what your escapes are this morning. I don't know what your habits and hurts and hangups are this morning, but I know this, we'll run into caves thinking that'll fix us and we'll become judgmental and we'll blame throw or blame sponge. Look what happens. I believe the Lord's about to reject Elijah's solution excuse and show him that he alone is Elijah's refuge. Then he said, verse 11, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after a wind, the earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. (laughs) But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And then after the fire, a still, small voice. Why was the Lord passing by? I believe he was trying to reveal himself. And an important truth that in the maturity of the prophet. And I think the Lord's doing that today. And before Elijah came out of the cave, these events took place. Elijah's still in the cave. God's told him to go out. And all of a sudden this rock shattering wind came about and just destroyed rocks and destroyed all around. See, some of you are in a cave right now and your whole family is cratering. Some of you have run into a cave of addiction and yet all around you, it's cratering. And then a massive earthquake shaking the foundations under his feet. Can you imagine being in that cave and the whole ground is shaking? Some of you are in your cave right now and the whole ground is shaking. A sudden fire followed. But this didn't announce the presence of the Lord. Verse 13, so it was when Elijah heard it. What did he hear? In fact, if you you look at that passage, it says when he heard it, talking about the voice of the Lord, he immediately recognized it. 
He wasn't in the spectacular. He wasn't in the supernatural. It said at that moment, he immediately recognized it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him again. What are you doing here, Elijah? After the fire, he heard that gentle blowing, a faint whisper, and it was God. What a lesson for Elijah. But, but look at me, look at me, look at look, look. What a lesson for us. What a lesson for us. Even God doesn't always operate in the realm of the spectacular. See, some of you are sitting here waiting on God to come tell you that you need to ask her to move out. You need to ask him to move out. You're waiting on God to say, you know what? You don't need to work seven days a week. And you're wanting some big spectacular vision or the plane. I love going to the beach and those planes that fly by with the big banners. You're waiting on the banner to fly by. And yet God's whispering in your heart in conviction for you so that you will realize your identity and you will connect these identities and, and round that story to grace for the glory of God that only God is your refuge. That only God is your refuge. God's primary vehicle for changing us or bringing reformation or revival is not the miraculous, the sensational, or even the crazy supernatural. It is like Israel experienced. It's God's voice speaking to us through his word, the inspired word of God, that we are in his word. And, 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 and it's that still small voice moving us and changing us. And yet in verse 14, after all these events, Elijah again justifies himself. How slow we are to learn how deep-seated our feelings of rejection and hurt have become established. And the feelings of rejection and hurt lead us to escapes, hurts, habits, and hang-ups that perpetuate those feelings of failure and rejection. And we get stuck on repeat just like Elijah. We just, we're just over here all the time. And oh, we've learned it so well, we can even make it look good, can't we? And we have forgotten who God has created us to be. That if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That the old is gone and the new has come. Instead, we're stuck on repeat. It's everybody else's fault. If you would just preach better sermons, preacher, I would be better, right? <laughs> if some, it would just do, offer us more opportunity to be here. There's nothing spiritual about this building. It's a red building metal building, red iron. Yes, God's people meet here, but there's nothing spiritual about this place unless we're in it. And the irony is, we seem to be more willing to depend on our escapes as a solution than we are to trust the Lord. If you go on and you finish the story, you find where God restored Elijah. And he sent him back and he was able to anoint the next prophet and it just had this incredible, and we've even find in the New Testament that Elijah was at the transfiguration of Christ. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? That God took that guy who was a colossal failure and he was one of the guys that showed up at the transfiguration. He was there. So what do we learn? What do we learn from this? Number one, I think comfort's overrated, isn't it? <laughs> comfort doesn't lead to happiness. If anybody ought to know, Americans ought to know. It makes us lazy. And forgetful and often it'll lead to self-absorption and boredom and discontent just like Elijah. But discomfort can be a tremendous catalyst for growth. That when the pain gets so great over here, it becomes a catalyst to lead us to our identity in Christ. That we begin to round out that story of grace for the glory and the magnifying of God's name. It becomes a catalyst for growth. Many of you don't like it because it's painful to grow. And we don't want to walk through that pain. And when the pain comes out in front of us, what we tend to do is want to put it behind us instead of learning from that. Discomfort can be a sign we're making progress. You've heard the expression, no pain, no gain. It's true. I remember when I was in junior high, the first time we had a long-term substitute teacher and I remember she came into the room and our teacher was going to be gone for the rest of the year. And I remember some of my buddies sitting around and I, I, I would not do this because my daddy would have killed me. But I remember some of my, my buddies were going, oh yeah, substitute teacher. Y'all remember that? Substitute comes in and everybody's going, oh yeah. No, we don't ever take tests. <laughs> and what we found out was is our substitute teacher was actually a better teacher than our regular teacher. 
You ever found that? All of a sudden that substitute teacher was even better than the, the normal teacher that we had. You know, I think pain is a surprising substitute teacher in our lives. Because we've gotten used to the things, the way things are. Our strategy, our thoughts, our perceptions. We are so ingrained on this tower that all of a sudden we need a substitute teacher called pain to come in and remind us of our identity. To remind us of how God's created us. You see, I think it, pain is that new teacher that we want to avoid or get rid of as soon as possible. But in reality, pain can be the best instructor, instructor of our life. Let me mention five things and we're going to go home. You ready for this? Number one, we are weaker, more self-absorbed, and more fragile than we've ever imagined. Do you know that? We are weaker, more self-absorbed, and more fragile than we've ever imagined. You see, as long as things are rocking along pretty well, we feel confident and in control. But just underneath that, when things start to fall apart or we choose to sin or someone sins against us, all of a sudden we have this hurt and conflict and it brings kind of the dark side of our personality and the dark side of who we are into the surface and we feel out of control. And for many of us, as I said last week, we immediately blame others or blame God or we just accept it that there's something wrong with us and the shame says there's something wrong with us. And then we begin to speak harshly to innocent people. We argue about the smallest things. We demand our way. We wallow in self-pity. We harbor bitterness instead of forgiving those who hurt us. And we may feel completely justified in all these attitudes and behaviors because we let it at new realization of these harmful perceptions and attitudes become the beginning point of repentance, wisdom, and growth. See, when we realize that we are more fragile than we ever realized, it can become the beginning point of combining these two towers to realize we all have them. We all have them. But it begins to lead to a health of a story that's based on the glory of God and not the glory of ourselves. That we are more weak and more fragile than we've ever dreamed or imagined. And number two, let me say this. Actually, we don't have a clue what God's up to. In fact, you could tweet that. You can Facebook that. We think we're pretty sharp. We assume we're in control. And for some of us in this room, we're exercising our authority over our domain. And you're pretty successful at it until you're not. Isn't that true? We're pretty successful at it until we're not. Our theology may be accurate that God is the only omniscient being in the universe, but some of us have assumed we have an inside track of knowing what God knows. <laughs> and it's all about control. It's all about trying to manage this instead of just putting this out there. We are vulnerable. We are fragile. Yet God says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new is coming. God wants to take all this right here and redeem that for the glory of God. Failure's never final as long as love exists. And now all of a sudden we realize we're not even close to God. That his glory and his infinite wisdom, that he is the king and the ruler of all. And we have no idea how God's gonna take the flaws and the pain and the sins and the evil world that we live in and he's gonna turn it into something redemptive and beautiful. But he promises that if we will trust him, he'll do it. In other words, he's gonna take all this right here and he's gonna take all this right here, he says about you, and he's gonna put that into a beautiful story to bring him glory. And you don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. The problem is I can't see the forest for the trees. You ever heard that? I'm just focused on the trees. And yet God's weaving this incredible story. And we suddenly realize we understand a millionth of a billionth of a zillionth of the magnificent and mysterious, mysterious plan of God for the ages. And see, at that point, we have a choice. We have a choice. Can I trust God with all of this? Because see, when you begin to trust God with all of this, it brings up the third thing. And it's simply this, is that we become more grateful. When our sense of entitlement fades, when we see all the gifts and the blessings of God through new eyes, 
Instead of taking love and health and salvation and time and friendships for granted and focusing on all the things that God hasn't done, we begin to reassess what's really important. See, we all have this. And God wants to take all of this and redeem this when you understand your identity so that our stories become a thing of power. You go, well, Jesus has never visited me. 2,000 years ago, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You and I weren't even fogging a mirror then. Think about that. And Christ died for you, for me. I mean, how powerful is that? I know some of you are still waiting on Jesus to come tap you on the shoulder. You see, some of you are waiting for that spectacular. And that still small voice is spoken. And all of a sudden, when we get our eyes off us, our heart begins to grieve to realize we don't have a clue what God's up to. That we've made success or the applause or power or the pain of a past injustice or hurt into an idol that we've created this idol in place of God. (laughs) And when we realize that God wants to take all of this and redeem it, we become grateful people. And in our grieving, we confess our sin. We just admit we are sinners. And we accept the wonder of his forgiveness. Isn't that amazing? I've said this so many times over the last three and a half years. You are fully loved and fully forgiven, and yet still some of us run to the juniper tree and run to the cave. That we just go ahead and confess that we are sinners. I'm living out of this story, and I keep telling myself over and over and over again, somebody needs to pay for my stuff. It's not me, but I'm gonna blame somebody else, and I'm telling you, it's not me. Somebody, no, 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 stop. Just confess. You don't have a fat clue what God's doing. That in reality, what God wants to do is redeem that. (laughs) And he did it through Jesus. Failure is never final as long as love exists. That we confess our sin and we accept the wonder of his forgiveness and we thank him for those things he graciously provided. Look at Colossians 1, 12 and 14. Always thanking God the Father. And he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us. Everybody say rescued. Rescued. Say it again. He's rescued you from the kingdom of darkness. He's rescued you from everything that happened to you as a teenager. He has rescued you from every failure you've had. He has rescued you from everything that you are believing over here. He's rescued you. And look what he says, he's transferred you. He's transferred you, dear son, into the kingdom. (laughs) Do you get what I'm saying here? He has rescued us and he's forgiven us of our sins. Why? For freedom. (laughs) For freedom. Listen, you're only as sick as your secrets. And some of you are harboring those secrets and scared to death if you tell anybody. And and, and really, if you tell God as if he doesn't know. Because you're just believing your failure. You've been rescued. And you have a choice now of whether or not you're going to trust him to be your refuge. You're going to stay in your cave. You're going to stay in your juniper tree. So your juniper tree may be your 401k. Your juniper tree may be those golden handcuffs. Your juniper tree may be your marriage that's fallen slap apart. It's a poor refuge compared to what God wants to do. Number four, we find out God to be beautiful instead of just useful. Some of us are blaming God and others. We've made God an end to a means of our success and happiness instead of the only one who rightly deserves worship, love, and loyalty. See, when God didn't come through for us and our marriage, our kids, our jobs, we were more than disappointed. You felt betrayed as if it was God's fault. Hadn't we done enough? Doesn't God owe us just a little bit? Doesn't God owe me just a little bit? And sooner or later, what God will do is he'll put the brakes on us to let us see what's really in our heart. 
Listen, God has a way of putting his finger on our most treasured possession. Let me say that again. God has a way of putting his finger on our most treasured possession. Just ask Abraham on that day on the mountain with Isaac. And what he wants to do, if you go back and read James, he wants to test us. Do you trust me? Do you understand who I am? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? And we find God to be beautiful when we realize he already knows all this. And then you begin to get around a group of men and women who also have embraced their failure and their sin and they've lined that up with their identity and their lives are bringing glory to God. And all of a sudden you find God to be beautiful instead of just useful, as if we can use him. We have opportunities in these times of testing for God to purify our hearts and change our motives and delight more than ever in the beauty of his grace and his greatness. And lastly, let me say this. When, when these stories, the twin towers of truth, of who we are in Christ, and all of our failures, sin, and pain come together, we become more tender, more understanding, more compassionate. You see, compassion didn't come out of a vacuum. I believe it's a character quality that has to be instilled in us through our experience of God's kindness when we've blown it or somebody else blew it and we're affected by it. Compassion doesn't come out of a vacuum. I believe God builds that deep into our life. And I think that's why last week you were so quiet because we were digging around some of that dark stuff last week, weren't we? And yeah, we've dug around a little bit more this week, John. Just kind of digging around down there, aren't we? And all of a sudden, we're weaker and more self-absorbed and more fragile than we ever imagined. And we don't have a clue what God's up to. We become more grateful when we begin to line those stories up and we find God to be beautiful. Failure is never final as long as love exists. And we become more tender, more understanding, and more compassionate. We become mature. And that maturity leads to a glory or a magnifying of God. Not ourselves, but of God. Listen to me. Failure is never final as long as love exists. And change is hard. I get it. Change is hard. But I believe it's essential. It's absolutely essential. We've seen in the life of Elijah that God's more interested in restoring you being in a relationship with you. I mean, think, Elijah was running from God. 40 days he ran from him, further into the wilderness. Some of you are there. And you need to hear this morning, God is more interested in restoring you and redeeming you for his name. Failure is never final as long as love exists. There is a life that God has for you on the other side of failure and pain. But you have to have the courage to step into it. That when he brings that failure and that shame and that sin and that, and that pain and those hurts and habits and hangups, go ahead and have the courage to step into that. Find out what God's trying to teach you. God's beautiful way more than he's useful. He's beautiful. That when we step through that and understand our identity, it creates this beautiful story of grace that the world is screaming and dying to hear. <laughs> I want that for you. He loves you warts and all. He knows all your caves. He, he's in the cave with you right now and he's begging you, come out. Come on. Come on. Let's line that up with who I say you are. And let's develop a beautiful story of grace. And I believe that's God's call to some of you this morning. Let me pray for you. Well, Father, I love you. And I thank you that you do love us, warts and all. That, God, you take these twin towers of truth. You know all of our failure. You know all of our pain. 
And God, I know there is some deep, deep pain in this room of stuff that I don't even know about and even could comprehend, but you do. And God, as we're deep into the soul last week and this week, I pray, God, that just as you touched Elijah, that you would touch the hearts of these men and women, these teenagers in this room, to say that they are safe in your presence. That you love them. That you forgive them. And God, I pray you'd give them courage to repent and confess and receive the beauty of your grace and all that you're doing to to develop a story of failure and identity that would bring you glory and honor. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you loved us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us so that we can have a relationship with you. And God, if there's somebody here this morning that has never surrendered their life to you, God, would you give them repentance this morning that they may repent of their sins and surrender their life to you right where they sit and you would change them. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everybody said, have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.